all right welcome back to my channel uh with another episode of stone lore this one's gonna be a little different than the usual ones it'll probably end up being a little bit longer and it'll be a lot uh more similar to my iceberg video except it'll be a little more high effort at least i think so basically i'm gonna go over my knowledge and uh, my theories and my understanding of the uh, all of the demigod characters including godfrey because i've seen him referred to as a demigod a couple times now i can't remember if it was in game or if it was just by vaddy vidya but uh, I'm basically just going to share off my knowledge and theories regarding them and just everything I think I know about them. I probably will end up forgetting some things or have missed some things, but uh, this is just supposed to be like a primer of my knowledge of the demigods and what I think they got going on behind the scenes. And again, I've probably missed a couple things, which you guys could point out for me in the comments if you feel like it. Really appreciate that. But without further ado, let's start with, uh, let's start with Godfrey. Referred to as the Lord of the Battlefield by more than a few people, he has a reoccurring lion motif, and he's, uh, well, he's America's first consort, or as far as we know, her, her first consort. A professional wrestling enthusiast in his spare time, Godfrey was the chieftain of this mysterious place called the Badlands, which is where Nefeli and the hero class hail from. He's also referred to as the forefather of all the tarnished, though this could be more in spirit as opposed to quite literally, but it is possible. I mean, maybe he was like Genghis Khan. Who who really knows, honestly? All Maybe all the starting classes are his descendants. It's, it's tough. I don't really know if there's any proof behind that. I know that one of them very for sure could be, maybe even two of them. Maybe the prisoner could be too. But uh, that's I'm going to save that for my video about the starting classes. But I mean, if Godfrey is the father of all the uh, tarnished, then that'd be pretty cool. I mean, that would kind of make you and all the other tarnished brethren in some kind of weird way. Like all sort of distant relations that are trying to kill each other in the case of the Volcano Manor. But anyway, moving on. He's also supposedly the first Elden Lord, as he's called many, many times. But there's also uh, Placidusix, Placidusix, whatever the fuck it's called. The uh, the, the two-headed dragon beyond time that's also referred to as the for the first true Elden Lord, but um, that could just be mean he was whatever the Elden Lord was before the age of the Earth Tree, and not necessarily the first Elden Lord, although he was in spirit. It's, it gets really goofy when you really explain it, but I mean I guess not. I mean it's pretty simple. There was before the age of the Earth Tree was the age of the Crucible. It's very possible that uh, Placidusix or however it's fucking called was the Elden Lord of that time, and Godfrey stomped his shit in and became the new Elden Lord with the help of America and all that after they whooped the Fell God, and you know the rest. So there's also very little info on this, but he had the Beast Regent Sirash, which is the big old ghostly lion on his back. He had it grafted onto his back, which maybe is the reason why uh, Godric, so far down the line, is so obsessed with grafting, because his ancestor did it. But... We don't really know much about Shirash, as I believe most of what I've learned is from a few descriptions and from watching Vadi's video, and it was like, he was gifted to Godfrey to help quell his beast, his bestial nature, like, so, if, if it wasn't for Shirash, basically, Godfrey would be all WWE pro wrestler all the time. He would just be a fucking maniac, ripping people to pieces and swatting people around all fucking willy-nilly. It would be really annoying. So they basically attached this lion, this ghostly lion, to his back to calm him down, which is really interesting because, you know, I guess lion, when you think about it, people think of lions as these, like, beastly creatures, but in reality, they sleep, like, fucking 23 hours of the day or some ridiculous number like that. So it kind of makes sense that attaching this lion ghost to him would, uh, would calm him down. But um, another thing I want to say about Godfrey before I move on to another one of these demigods is that He's said to have come back in the beginning, like in the opening credits and all that, but he spends the entirety of the fucking game and story doing fuck all, like where is he? We're out there killing his fucking descendants and his sons at one point, and where is he at? He doesn't show up until literally the end of the fucking game when the Earth Tree's on fire. Like, then he just, oh, oh, the Earth Tree's on fire, I guess I better, I mean, I guess, who knows? Who knows how long he'd been gone? Maybe he was, uh, off trying to get laid somewhere or some shit like that. Like, who really, uh... Who really knows? But still, he doesn't show up until the end of the fucking game, and he picks up his son. He's like, oh, shit, someone's murdered my son who, surprise, surprise, I actually cared about. Well, you wouldn't know it from your actions because you did fuck all. He could he could have really uh, used your help, you know what I mean, since he got back. Uh, Morgoth, he probably would have been happy to see his dad again. 
And, you know, but no, you took your time. I mean, honestly, it's just, it's goofy to keep going in on Godfrey because we really don't know, but it's just funny that he shows up at the very end. But I think some of the redeeming qualities of Godfrey were how he became a demigod and that he just killed everything during the crucible and then banged a god and became a demigod. That's definitely the coolest way. That definitely beats being born a demigod. It's a lot cooler. It's also funny that Radon, who was the son of Radagon and Renala, also idolized Godfrey, which, you know, he even, like, modeled his whole lion, like, armor and shit like that after him. I mean, I'm sure he idolized his dad, too, probably, but Godfrey was, like, the warrior of warriors, supposedly. And I would definitely say that the least cool stuff about um, Godfrey, like definitely the lame stuff about him, is how he spams his fucking stomp attack near the end of his first phase. That was really annoying the first time I fought him, and then like when I was helping my girlfriend fight him. It's just like he just spams it like endlessly. That's, that's pretty fucking annoying. But other than that, oh yeah, and that he kind of just like didn't even realize America stole his grace from him. Like that just kind of makes him look like he's kind of a big idiot, just a brute. You know what I mean? Which is, I guess, self-explanatory. I mean, look at the guy, but... I don't know. There isn't that much else I could think of about Godfrey. Other than that he's the father of Godwin, Morgoth, and Mog. And um, the ancestor of Godfroy, or Godfroy, and Godric, the grafted. Both of those two are grafted, and they're really uh, really confusing when you, when you look at them. You're like, why are they exactly the same? I mean... Did From Software just completely reuse the boss, or is there any kind of lore explanation? Well, there slightly is, but that's not important right now. Anyway, we're going on to the next one, who is the son of Godfrey. The and he's also turned into a sea monster. I'm of course speaking of Godwin the Golden. Also known as the Prince of Death. Now where do we begin with this interesting looking creature? I guess first off is that he's probably the uh, lord mentioned in the Mausoleum Knight's description, or at least Lutel's description, who says uh, she's she died willingly, gave herself to death to serve her soulless lord. And there's really only one soulless lord that's ever mentioned in the story, and that's Godwin, so I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that's who at least Lutel serves. There's also the whole situation at Castle Soul, which seems to have been Mikella, the unalloyed's attempt at curing Godwin of his soullessness, because there's a spirit there that mentions the fact that they failed Mikella and that his comrade remains soulless. So it seems like Castle Soul's purpose was to cause some kind of eclipse to resurrect Godwin, and Mikella had charged, you know, Nial with guarding the place and keeping it sacred for that specific purpose. It even houses the Eclipse Shotel, which has to do with the ghost flame and the death flame and Godwin and all that stuff. But that I haven't pieced together a whole narrative for, but that's just uh, interesting and useful information I felt like I should mention in this. But other than that, um, he's the first of the dead gods, which is, I guess, pretty prestigious. I mean, not really for him, considering he probably isn't sentient really anymore, but... You know, he's growing everywhere, like, his, uh, he's turning into some kind of a fish tree with, like, roots, yet a piece of his face is, like, all the way, has made it all the way down to Stormville basement, but it's not really his face, it's actually just, he has the face of death, basically, and that just will appear everywhere, it even appears on crabs, various different crabs. Specifically, there's these ones that are located right above the throne of death, but still, I believe another group of them can be found in Lyrnia. He was good friends with the dragons, uh, Lanisax and Fortisax, and, um, they taught him, like, lightning incantations or something like that. It was definitely, he was the friend of dragons. He was sort of like the Nameless King type character, uh, from Dark Souls 3, who was a friend of dragons. But then literally had his whole name and shit erased for it, so. The Nameless King probably should have been born in, uh, the Lands Between. He would have been a lot better off. Wouldn't have had to. Well, I guess that's not really a dragon he rides, is it? That's like some kind of, like, big flying shock turkey or something. No, I'm just kidding. I know that the uh, dragons of Dark Souls often have feathers sometimes. But since we're on the subject of Dark Souls 1, there's also this funny theory that um, Godwin becomes Gravelord Nido. Like, you know, in those shared universe theories that are probably better left just as theories and never confirmed because there's a lot of holes in them from time to time. I just think this one's funny because, you know, Nido is referred to as the first of the dead and, you know... Godwin the Golden is the first of the dead demigods, so definitely there's some similarity there. If anything, they serve a similar purpose, but I don't think that uh, 
Nito and Goblin are the same. But if the worlds are connected and Miyazaki did agree to all, or like intended on all that, then I mean, sure, why not? You know what I mean? But um, there's also the fact that he clapped Fia's cheeks despite being dead. You know, that's pretty, uh, well, I guess you would have to be dead to clap Fia's cheeks because she is the deathbed companion. She only, she only bangs dead guys. So, like I said, it was all a long con to, uh, to get laid. That's, that's, makes sense to me. I mean, he probably foresaw the future of, uh, of getting laid by Fia and all he had to do was just allow himself to get killed by Black Knife Assassins. And he was like, you know what? It's worth it. It's definitely worth it. There's also the uh, controversial theory that Merica pulled a Casey Anthony on uh, on old Godwin here and had him killed, or at least took part in it, or at least gave Randy the means to get it done, but maybe didn't know that Godwin was going to die in the process. I mean, there's a million different possibilities, and none of it really is. Uh, there's not much evidence for any of the uh, arguments, but I think it's definitely possible. I mean, there's the fact that the Newman women were the same race as Merica, but perhaps they showed up to get revenge on Merica because whatever world she left, and she maybe she left it in ruins, and maybe these specific assassins had this grudge against her and tracked her across the, uh, you know, the universe or whatever, the cosmos or whatever the fuck, how she ended up in the lands between. But to exact revenge and to do that they helped Rani you know with her plots but I, I don't know you know it's tough to say there's the finger reader crones that like suggest that Godwin was always supposed to die but like a proper death but that really could just mean anything that could really not mean anything at all but it's it's interesting I mean does that mean that possibly uh, America foresaw Godwin's death and just was like well there's nothing I could do to avoid it so I might as well just be complicit in it but again, she could have just been unknowingly... Uh, there's a million possibilities, and there's no real reason for me to keep reiterating them. But moving on. He's also sort of spreading across the uh, the underground of the Lands Between like a virus in a lot of ways. And there's these uh, basilisks that seem to carry his death blight, and they seem to spread it for him to the places he can't even reach. Sort of like rats in the plague, you know, like disease carriers in a, in a lot of ways. Which reminds me that there's also the fact that uh, there's a possibility that Godwin himself may be turning into uh, a basilisk. Although, as a lot of people have pointed out, I think it's possible or more likely that Godwin's uh, scales are in some way a result of uh, Fortisax trying to free him from being undead to give him a true death, trying to go inside his mind. And it said, you know, Fortisax was said to have been corrupted for it but got nothing done. And perhaps it left a little bit of itself in Godwin's, you know, remains, at least to the point where it started manifesting scales and the fact that the remembrance of the Lich Dragon is obtained from Godwin. So there's those two things that I think definitely factor in heavily to why he has scales. But it's interesting to note that his death blight disease or whatever, it, it's likely that it could have predated his death, but he's now just the current source of it. Like, we don't really know much about the Deathbirds, God of Death, but it's possible that the Mausoleum Knights and all that predate Godwin too, and that they have something to do with the Death Outer God. I've, def I've currently been researching into all that, but that's going to be covered in a whole other video. Um, but there's definitely evidence of his death blight, or, you know, the effects of his death blight as far away as Crumbling Fair Missoula, where there's a bunch of big ass worm faces that are, like, heavily afflicted with death blight. So it's really, you know, did those guys predate Godwin or did those guys end up out there because of destined death and all that? The association with um, Farrah Missoula and the Black Flame and Malekith and the Black Blade and all that. Is that why? Well, you know, it's tough to say. Because it's not like Godwin's roots or basilisk can make it all the way up into the city in the sky, you know. But I think one of the coolest things about Godwin is probably that he's a friend to skeletons and with him there will always be skeletons in the lands between and you know I don't know about you guys but I enjoy the skeletons of all these games same in like Oblivion and old games like that I don't know something about a skeleton enemy it just makes me feel like old school like I'm playing an old school game or some shit but the goofiest thing I think about him is his resemblance maybe intentionally or not to the three-eyed raven i mean obviously not physically but the fact he's growing into a tree deep underground in some hollow dash grounds definitely seems to resemble or call to mind the three-eyed raven from game of thrones who was you know at least in the show was handled goof goofy as hell and in the books is definitely something more sinister than was than what was portrayed in the show but 
Again, this isn't about that. We got to move on to the next one. That's all I had about Godwin so far. Uh, well, again, these are just summaries, but still moving on to the next one. To possibly the most sus of the demigods, MOG445, or Mog, Lord of Blood, or Mog the Omen. He's Fucking pedophile rapist. He's got a few different names. He's also the son of Godfrey and America, except unlike Godwin, he was born an omen with a bunch of fucking horns, like straight up masses of horns everywhere. His horns are a lot different than uh, his brother Morgoth's, but we'll get to Morgoth whenever uh, we get to him on the list. Anyway, Mog is most famous for kidnapping Mikella and, you know, doing whatever he's doing to it, you know, doing to Mikella. He's like inside Mikella, but as Mikella's blood, I don't know, it's very, the, the implications of that scene are pretty, you know, pretty dark, but... Uh, yeah, so he's for all intents and purposes like Elden Ring's own like super pedophile because uh, Mikella was born and cursed to forever be a child. So Mikella might not be a kid, but the fact you know the fact that he's in the body of a giant kid is a little a little sus. Anyway, Mog cut um, Mikella from the Halig tree all the way over in the consecrated snowfield, or actually past the consecrated snowfield, and uh, probably stole some of the albinarks that were living there on his way out that's that would explain all of the uh the blood red albinarics that are lingering in the mogwin's palace these ones seem to be like i don't know the the real blood mixed with their artificial you know anatomy seems to have done something weird they're able to like turn into these spike balls i mean I, you guys have all seen them they're very disgusting like one of the other bosses on here you fight this guy more than once uh first you fight well likely the first time you'll fight him is on the way down to the frenzied flame at this little like chapel deep past the uh, the shunning grounds, which is said to be where all the omens lived, like all the omens that survived. Uh, well, not not even the ones that survived, the ones that were kept secret, the royal omens. The ones that survived getting their horns cut off were used as you know infantry, heavy infantry units and shit like that. And it looks like like I mentioned before, but there's like a band of escaped ones that are like sacking the hearses over in the Atlas Plateau, and I always thought that was really cool. But anyway, Mog seems to have made a pact with an outer god called the Formless Mother that bestows power on a, a cursed blood, which is, I imagine, in this case, the blood of the omen, since it's considered cursed. Even though the whole omen thing, it might actually just be, and probably is, just the crucible returning or trying to come back to power after all this time being suppressed by the Earth Tree. So what he's trying to do with Mikella is similar to how the uh, current like world logic works in that there's a uh, outer god and then there's like the vessel or vassal i believe it's vassal that basically holds power for them in the lands between and um they're usually the vassal is called an empyrean and they usually have a consort in america's case her consort was godfrey and what mog is trying to do is he's trying to be the consort to michaela who is an empyrean it's stated multiple times is, is credited by melania as being the most fearsome empyrean of them all but you know, we only ever see descriptions of him being kind, but we'll talk about him when we get to him. Anyway, Mog, he's like totally fucking insane and a straight up cringe lord, but he has straight up drip. I mean, he has, look at those robes, they're pretty badass. And the sanguine nobles are also dripped up and have like, in my opinion, some of the coolest looking weapons in the game. I think the uh, the bloody head lice or whatever the fuck it's called, I think it's supposed to be a bloody helix. But uh, that coiled sword great rapier thing is really fucking cool i wish it did more damage but you know i still have fun with it it's got a really uh situational uh you know ash of war with the whole dynast finesse but still a really cool weapon and their fucking fits are really dripped up i mean the the top piece kills with just about anything as long as you have you know like black uh leggings and I've alleged once and I'll allege again that uh, I believe Mog is one of the Fell Twins or at least like some kind of like an, a, the Fell Twin is an apparition of him and his brother Morgoth because they're the only omens who are described as twins and they still have their horns. I mean there's just enough evidence to prove it's them as there is to not prove it's them but it's one of those nice little headcanon things I always keep in the back of my head. He's got, in my opinion, what I would consider the uh, the worst voice acting in the entire game. I mean, I just feel like he seems so out of place. I mean, then again, maybe he's supposed to sound all weird and unnerving and just like a cringe lord, like not not unnerving in the good way, like in the way that he sounds like a fucking redditor. But um, he also imprisoned a fiddle playing merchant, and I thought the guy was playing um, the Lord of the Rings music from the films, but I guess he's actually playing some from Kingsfield, I believe. Someone pointed out to me. I can't remember. I'm probably getting that wrong too. But cool little merchant, but he's straight up imprisoned by the uh, blood drinkers. 
Which, of course, when I say blood drinkers, brings to mind uh, Kanehurst Manor from Bloodborne and uh, the similarities. You know, those guys were... I mean, a lot of things in Bloodborne were obsessed with blood. You know, blood was like a, a big part of it besides all the Lovecraftian Cosmos stuff. And my one of my favorite things is this description that says, like, he's trying to found a new dynasty with Mikella, but it, it probably, he's just, you know... It's probably just the ravings of a madman or some shit like that. I always thought that was funny. So, he, you know, he probably is just an insane dude. He, But he does have some kind of power given to him by some kind of outer god. But whether or not the formless mother actually wants to take over or give any kind of power to Mikella is, you know, is relatively uh, uncertain to say the least. And from, like, a design standpoint, to me, he looks like Elden Ring's take on, like, a classical, you know, goat man, demon kind of thing. Sort of like that red sylvan on uh, the mountain in fucking towards the end of the witcher 3 forget what his name is i think it's like fugus or something like that but sort of like that and that you know it's like the classical big ogre demon looking thing like the fucking things in wandavision so that's one side of the fell twins now we're on to the well one of my favorite uh demigods and characters in Elden ring and a dude who definitely deserves his own solo video which i will put together and write a script for is morgot the Omen King. Ever ye desire to appear lordly and gracious as a king of all. Or Margaret the Fell Omen, Morgoth the Grace Given, the Veiled Monarch, uh, the Last of All Kings. He's a bit like Daenerys from Game of Thrones with his ridiculous amount of names. Also born to America and Godfrey, he was Mog's twin brother, also born an omen and forced to grow up in the sewers, a place called the Shunning Grounds where they were like worshipped by some weirdos who made these omen barons. But anyway, he was pretty much ignored until the shattering happened and then he sprung out of the sewers and the greater will or the golden order or whatever the fuck decided to uh, then use him as a pawn for the next however many years because he was then used to defend the capital of Landell from any kind of incursion and there he stayed until the events of the game. Now he's a bit like a rival character in that we fight him potentially three different times. The first of course being at uh, Stormvale where he's using the alias Margaret the Fell Omen and then again at the fields in the Atlas Plateau on the way up to Landell where he's again Margaret the Fell Omen but he just sort of like possesses some random peasant or he was disguised as some random peasant but that's not even a boss fight that's just like a powerful enemy fight and then for the third time his true boss fight is Morgoth the Omen King at the foot of the Erd Tree so he's the closest thing to a, a pursuer that we'll get I guess the bell bearing hunter also sort of fills that void as he's a bit like the pursuer too completely forgot about him but moving on as previously stated he grew up in the sewers like some type of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle where he was shunned all his life until the time came where he had to rise up to the occasion. And he did, as the Veiled Monarch, for probably no other reason than the fact that he was Godfrey's son and it was his duty. Morgoth seems to have this insane, almost Stockholm Syndrome sense of duty. Whereas uh, Edgelord Mog was like the rebel, the black sheep of the family. He was born blessed by the Crucible, possibly due to his father Godfrey's own association with the Crucible being like the leader of the Crucible Knights and having gained a considerable amount of power during the Crucible. But because of this, because he grew horns, he was shunned and kept in the sewer and treated as basically like he didn't exist, despite his birthright being that he was he should have been the mightiest of demigods, Godfrey's son. But instead, you know what I mean, he was cursed to be kept down in the sewers. He's pretty much one of the more tragic characters of the game. I mean, Radon's up there for being tragic, but I definitely think Morgoth's got him beat. I mean, after the shattering, he commissioned the sentry torches to be made, which basically they're these torches that allow you to see through the veil of the Black Knife assassins, basically trying to ensure that the Knight of Black Knives would never happen again because his brother Godwin was killed. Now, it's unconfirmed whether or not him and Godwin had any type of relationship, but it seems that at least Godwin knew of him and they'd at least spoken once because Godfrey knew Morgoth as we see in Godfrey's fight where he's you know like cradling Morgoth's corpse and like saying you know it's been a while since we last spoke so it's not insane to assume that he also knew Godwin as his alias Margaret the Fell Omen he was said to have piled high the bodies of tarnished warriors for you know years and years just piling up these warriors corpses they probably never made it into Landell for the most part and if he was ambushing people in front of Stormvale they probably didn't make him make it past his uh his apparition very often 
Which to me, I always thought was interesting because I actually had more trouble with Margit than Godric, but maybe, I don't know, I, I don't think I leveled up much in between the two of them either. I just always felt like Margit was the harder of the two. Godric obviously has a little bit more health, but it definitely makes sense once you get towards that part of the game and you realize, oh, Margit was just using a portion of his power in that fight. But as far as gameplay goes, his actual boss fight isn't that hard. I mean, you know, neither is Radon's really. I mean, even though you do jump him, but we'll get to Radon when we get to Radon. I was just mentioning it because there's always an argument that that props up because of that picture of Morgoth stabbing Radon in the shoulder, and there's, that always comes with a with an argument. As the Fell Omen, he was also said to have led the Knights Cavalry, and they were often referred to as the uh, the hands of the Fell Omen or the eyes and ears of the Fell Omen because they served him in secrecy, likely loyal to his you know immense strength and you know talent as the Veiled Monarch. And maybe they even knew his true identity as Godfrey's son, which would make sense to, for him to have these powerful warriors under his uh, control. And then there was uh, also Banished Knight Oleg, who also, he uh, he invited him to return to, you know, he lifted his banishment. And Oleg did such a bang-up job that he even got an Erd Tree burial and ended up his spirit ashes. I mean, I'm not really sure what the whole thing with spirit ashes is yet. I'm going to do a whole video about it once I have a further understanding of it. But, uh... He also hated his cursed status, similar to how the vulgar militia hates being short. Instead of, you know, embracing, you know, his horns like Mog did, Morgoth sealed all of his uh, accursed blood away in his sword, and it became this, like, walking stick-like cane that he uses as a club to whack people over the head with. It actually looks a little bit like the Death Rite poker, you know, if it was upside down. It works good for a Margit cosplay if you're trying to look like the guy. So he was basically born too late to be revered, and instead it was shunned. He has this insane case of Stockholm Syndrome and a somewhat misguided sense of duty. But the best thing about Morgoth is that he talks shit every single time he's defeated. Like you defeat him as Margot, he talks shit again, both times. Defeat him as Morgoth, he talks shit and then you can go up to his body where he will talk more shit to you. He's like laid out by the throne, everybody's probably seen it by now, but it just, I always thought that was funny. This guy just never stops talking shit, it's pretty gangster. And it's something I can definitely uh, respect. Also, I like how he just straight up wears rags in comparison to his brother who's all dripped out. I think, you know, I think the rags, the, the Fell Omen cloak is definitely one of the coolest item pieces in the game. And it looks really badass, but uh, I just thought it was funny. Like, they're like complete opposites, these two twin brothers. But moving on to the next one. The extremely despicable and cowardly Godric the Grafted. He... Finish him! He calls himself Godric the Golden, possibly because he's descended from Godwin, but for all intents and purposes, he's Godric the Grafted, and he's very likely descended from Godfroy or Goldfroy the Grafted, who is a sort of like a copy-paste boss version of... Uh, Godric, but uh, he existed way before Godric did and was attacked and defeated by some guy named Ancient Knight or Dragon Knight Kristoff, who got an Erd Tree burial for taking him out or imprisoning him in the uh, Evergel. But anyways, back to Godric. Often referred to as barely a demigod, he's got this bizarre obsession with this thing called grafting. Now what grafting is, is the art of uh, taking limbs and pieces and even parts of torsos and um, grafting them onto yourself or even replacing parts of your torso as a, as he appears to have replaced his own torso with a fucking troll torso and he's got an insane amount of hands grafted onto his back and then he grafts the dragon head onto himself he's got this weird fetish for grafting now that probably comes from that godfroy guy i mentioned that's the only really explanation I could think of other than the fact that also Godfrey has a lion grafted onto his back so maybe he grafts as a sort of um, reverence or homage or homage to Godfrey it's really tough to say he seems to really let a lot ride on his whole golden lineage heritage and all that but I would say for sure he likely isn't Godwin's son like some people have suggested he calls a dragon his true heir which could be either referencing Godwin or maybe even the Storm King because he's located in Stormvale or the fact, like I said, that Godwin was super close to dragons and maybe Godwin, well, Godwin would have to be in some way his ancestor. So maybe that has something to do with why he calls the dragon his true heir. And you take a look at a guy like Godric the Grafted and you're like, well, this guy definitely doesn't need a hand. 
But he fucking sends out hunters to scour the world for tarnished so he can graft their limbs onto himself. Because, again, I'm pretty sure tarnished are considered Godfrey's, you know, heirs or Godfrey's descendants. So maybe he has to, like... So maybe for him to be able to graft human limbs onto himself, they have to match some form of bloodline or share a common ancestor with him for it to actually work. It's really, it's never explained. Which is like most things in this game, that's why channels like mine exist. To throw out wacky but oddly convincing theories like that. There's also an interesting theory where Godric might be an imprisoned lord, and by that I mean he's allowed to play lord over in Stormvale and watch over the, uh, the, uh, the surrounding areas, but, you know, he's there basically as a prisoner and captive of Melenia's. That's an interesting theory to me. It has to do with the uh, Storm Generals. I did a whole video about it, but it seems more likely that the reason his uh, soldiers are out in the countryside in places like Castle Morn, where they're being besieged by uh, an, a revolt of misbegotten, I believe. But the reason there's none at the castle seems to be more the fact that uh, he's bolstered his forces with mercenaries and he probably freed a penal colony or two, and that would explain why he's got this large force of exile knights. Although, there's some interesting placements of things in the uh, in the castle. Like, there's a bunch of, a whole complement pointed at the door containing a grafted scion, and you think, well, the grafted scion probably has to do with Godric. Why are they pointed at it? But, you know, that's hardly enough evidence to suggest uh, what I'm suggesting. But it's nonetheless a fun theory. Because we know Melenia defeated him and only spared him because, you know, probably because Mikella didn't want his great rune. Mikella was trying to do his own thing with the Halleck tree outside of the Elden Ring, so he probably had no use for it. But it is confusing then that Melenia and Radon fought. Maybe Radon was the aggressor. I, I forget. There's probably confirmed somewhere in the game which one of them two was the aggressor. Perhaps they just didn't even like each other or they came into conflict over, you know, something other than a great rune. But speaking of Radon, Godric is also said to have disguised himself as a fucking woman to escape Radon's sieging of the capital. Radon was probably pushed back by Margaret the Fell Omen as we see in that, you know, polarizing picture of the two fighting. Which I keep trying not to ramble off about stuff on, but there was a comment that someone was saying that it was a grafted sky on and a red maid knight fighting, and that just, that just isn't correct. But uh, anyway, moving on. Another funny thing about Godric is that he's a... Uh, tarnished the reputation of the golden lineage pun intended because you know it was a respected lineage when godwin and godfrey were around and if, if more god had been known about it it would still be respected but you know nowadays it's pretty much hated because you've got skyons like uh godric here or godfroy you know who are just jokes he gets roasted on pretty hard by Kenneth Haight, who's, you know, the deposed lord down over in Limgrave. I mean, the guy can't even get his own castle back, so who, who's he to talk? But still, it's still funny. And I think my final note about uh, Godric is that Gostok might be his son. Zoli the Witch did an interesting video that seems to prove almost that Gostok was his son. He even looks like Godric a little bit. So I just thought that was a fun note I'd want to mention. I don't really have to elaborate on that. If you want to look into that more, I'd suggest watching Zoli the Witch's video. She's a pretty great YouTuber uh, who makes Dark Souls content. Now moving on to uh, the next batch of demigods. So I'm trying to do them in groups. So I just did the kids of Godfrey and Merica. Now we're going to go on to the kids of Radagon and Renala. Starting with my favorite demigod besides Morgoth. Praetor Rikard, the motherfucking blasphemous one. Let us devour the gods together. Now, like Morgoth, this guy deserves a whole video dedicated to him, and I will, I will put one together. I'm just still working out a couple theories I still have going when it comes to his his science projects like the uh the carrion hands or the finger creepers or the wall masters or whatever the fucking hand things are called i'm pretty sure he created those but starting off he's the son of renala and radagon as i already mentioned he's brother to rani the witch you know everybody who the one who everybody simps for you know the uh the chick with four arms and He's also a brother to the Chad General Radon, who all, everybody also loves. I feel like Rykard usually doesn't get enough love because his siblings are so famous, you know, to the community. But right out the gate, this dude wields the Penitent One sword from fucking Blasphemous, and I don't know where the uh, the spear ended up. I know that um, some of the armor ended up on Elmer of the Briar, 
but straight up, Rikard wields the uh, the blasphemous sword. It's even called the blasphemous sword. It has to be a reference to blasphemous. I mean, look at the fucking thing. It's not an exact, you know, like three D version of it or anything, but it definitely seems inspired by the uh, the sword, which I believe was called uh, fuck. What was it? Oh, Mea Culpa. That's what it was. It's been a while since I played Blasphemous. But yeah, right out the gate, that made me like Rykard. I mean, the sword is super powerful, too, if you're like a faith build and with a little bit of strength and dex. Super useful thing. It's got a crazy powerful weapon art, but it's not too OP like Moonvale or Rivers of Blood or anything like that. It's got a really slow fucking... And it's easy to dodge in PvP. It's just super useful in the PvE if you're in a tight spot and you need to knock down a bunch of small enemies. So at some point, Rykard left the lands between and traveled far and wide across a bunch of different other countries that are pretty much all unnamed. But he came back with this chick named Tanith, who was, you know, truly uh, enthralled by him. You know, she truly, you know, was charmed by Rykard. And um, sometime after he came back, or maybe even before he left, he also went to Mount Gilmere and established himself there and discovered these, uh, these like hexes that had to do with the magma of the volcano he also discovered a, a serpent worshiping cult too while he was down there but he modernized the hexes into actual sorceries using his knowledge of uh i guess science in this world and sorceries are like one and the same almost so his knowledge of both he used to create you know this new kind of lava magic which was interesting because fire for the most part is reserved for incantations only so you know he made some revolutionary strides there Another interesting thing about Rykard is that when Merica banished Godfrey and uh, the Tarnished and robbed them of their grace, he was one of the few people who questioned it, likely adding to his reputation as being blasphemous just for questioning what something Merica did. But it's definitely, you know, he was also considered a kind lord prior to feeding himself to the serpent. But I suppose we should get to the part where, you know, he fed himself to the fucking serpent. But before we talk about what he's most famous for, you know, feeding himself to a snake, I think we should probably uh, examine his involvement with the uh, Knight of Black Knives and his uh, sister Rani's plot and all that. So it's possible he may have had some hand in sourcing the Black Knife assassins or something because Rani awarded him with this uh, blasphemous claw, which, you know, if needed, could allow him to channel Malekith, you know, who every single demigod was said to be afraid of. Rykard was ready to run his fade. The main reason all demigods were afraid of Malekith, though, was of course because he possessed death. He could deliver death to them. No one else could because of the way America had set things up in the world. He was the only thing that could actually kill them, so most of them were afraid of this. And because, you know, Rykard helped Rani in some undisclosed way, it was obviously of some kind of, you know, importance to Rani for her to reward him with this fucking relic, though. Because it allows you to literally counter death itself, like the the black flame, red, the, not black flame, the dark red flame that Malekith wields, specific to him and the Black Knife Assassins, it can only be countered by the uh, Blasphemous Claw. Actually, you know, it really can't be countered in the cases of the Knife Assassins at all, or the uh, Vulgar Militia, but when you fight Malekith it can. Which is probably just a gameplay oversight, but who knows, maybe it's intentional. You never know when it comes to these FromSoft games. But Rani knew that if Malekith would find out what they did, she, he would probably come after, uh, well, both of them, but first he would come after fucking Rykard, since, you know, Rani doesn't necessarily have a body anymore to come after. She's just a possessed doll. So she gave him this claw, so, you know, if the day came, he'd be able to defend himself and actually win. Now, this involvement in a conspiracy that left at least one demigod dead made Rykard wonder about a few things. You know, first off, how could he be free of the uh, greater will? And remember that snake cult I mentioned? Well, first off, snakes are a sign of blasphemy or, you know, sacrilege to the to the Erd Tree for some reason because that's why the uh, depraved perfumers wear them because they just say, like, fuck the Erd Tree. I don't really know why. It likely has something to do with this cult, though. So Rykar discovered this cult and this ancient religion and these snake men down in the mountain. And he he constructed Volcano Manor, as I, as I said earlier, and probably in the process, that's when he found it. He, there's also a magma worm randomly down there, but he might have just, you know, kept that thing as a pet later in life. But anyway, he, uh, he found the God-eating serpent, and uh, he fed himself to it. Now, many people think, you know, he did this just so he can become more powerful and be able to devour other gods because of, you know, his dialogue. 
But it was also to be free of the greater will, similar to how his sister Rani had her body destroyed, but her soul lingering on, allowing her to operate freely of the uh, greater will. Well, especially when she killed her fingers. But Rikar did it and took it in a much more gruesome way and straight up fed himself to a giant snake. The fact that Gelmir's being besieged for some reason by Landell or did or was besieged at some point also seems to hint that he was a. Uh, maybe openly on his sister's side against the forces of the golden order it's really tough to say you know there's so little information available about that maybe there maybe you guys could tell me i missed something you know when it comes to the uh the battle that was fought in gelmir i'm sure there was several different battles obviously but we don't really know what entirely became of the gelmir knights and soldiers we know that he probably used them or consumed them in some way to get stronger in, in the pursuit of power but we don't know i mean i saw somewhere someone said something about Maybe he used them to make some fucking jar warriors, you know, because there's a bunch of jars that seem to live down there. And who knows? Maybe he knows how to make jar warriors. I, I thought maybe he invented them, but they seem to predate him. But he could know how to make them despite not being their original creator. That's entirely possible. I mean, I'm pretty sure he created those carrying hands and is the uh, ancestor of the finger creeper mentioned in the ringed finger weapon description because that ringed finger looks an awful lot like his. it belonged to him, you know what I mean? Definitely think that that's from his hand or was from his hand at some point because look how big the motherfucker is i mean they talk about radon being big but look at fucking rykard anyway after turning into a snake or getting eaten by a snake he allowed tanith to basically take over things she has this crucible knight bodyguard and basically runs volcano manor and formed the recusants as a way of sort of bringing in powerful people to consume like they gather up all these tarnished and they hunt other tarnished and become stronger in the process and then once they become strong enough they get an audience with Rikard who then promptly eats them to become stronger and you know he joins the you know you join the colony he likes to think of it as some kind of hive mind but I don't really think that the other things that get eaten have any sentience it's not like uh, it's not like Ermac or anything and like most demigods he leaves a, a bit of himself behind after his defeat like in this case it's his head where it's being slowly consumed by Tanith, who he probably used to bang or something, because she's like, let me finish eating this, uh, you know, our Lord's corpse. He's got a lot left for me to consume. You know, and uh, that's kind of weird, but maybe it's like, uh, it's very reminiscent of uh, Bloodborne, and when it comes to Albert, when he obliterates the fucking queen of the Canehurst, or at least that's what it reminded me of. But I'm definitely going to do a whole video on Rykard, probably like a biography style thing. But anyway, uh, I spent enough time on him. Moving on to Ranny the Witch. I'm a witch, okay? I'm a witch! And I curse both of you and all of your stupid guns. <laughs> Charlie! God damn it! Give me that! So every From Software game has a witch character, and this game is no different. I mean, there's uh, Carla from Dark Souls 3. There's, uh, shit, who is in Dark Souls 2? Well, I don't think we ever actually meet her, but Zoli the Witch, who is mentioned in Alva's descriptions, so I guess she counts. And again, in uh, Dark Souls 1, there's the, uh, which witch is it? Beatrice, the summon for the fucking uh, butterfly fight. Yeah, so there's always a witch character, and Rani sort of fills that kind of role. But uh, she's a demigod in this game, and the daughter of Renala and Radagon, like her brothers Rykard and Radon. And despite the fact that she has four arms, she still needs a hand. Thank you, I'll be here all week. Anyway, though, she's fond of wolves, or in uh, Blythe's case, beastmen or wolfmen. She was mentored by a snowy crone that worshipped a dark moon, which is different than Renala's full moon, and imparted cold sorceries to the young demigod. So, basically, she just taught her a bunch of witchcraft. And Rani's mentor might have been a Zamor. I mean, it's possible. They, they say that Torrent was the uh, originally belonged to Rani's mentor. And if he's from the north and she's from the north, she has to do with cold sorceries. Zamor have to do with cold sorceries. I think it's possible. I mean, we never actually see her. We just know that she supposedly resembled this doll. There's a pretty popular theory that Rani is Melina, but since we're just throwing out random ass theories, then uh, I think she got body snatched or something to that effect by the snowy crone when she pulled the knight of uh, black knives i mean how do we know that what we're actually talking to is ranny i mean there's no real proof is there could i mean her mentor would also know everything ranny knew so i mean again i'm just throwing that out there since we're throwing out crazy conspiracies 
She's potentially the uh, demigod we have the most interactions with, though, and her voice actress rivals Morgoth for the uh, best voice acting in the game, in my opinion. She's also great in Peaky Blinders, and I think uh, I think she was also in Luther, the show with uh, the cop show with Idris Elba. That show's pretty good, but the fifth season is kind of fucking wacky. Like, I feel like they kind of didn't know what they were doing there. But anyway, I digress. She gave Rykard the Blasphemous Claw to deal with any potential repercussions of his involvement in the Night of Black Knives. We're still not sure exactly what he did to help her, but he did something worthy enough to, you know, warrant getting that cool-ass reward. And you can even uh, marry Rani or propose to her in a way, and as is carry and custom, like we know from what her mom forged for uh, Radagon, that they, uh, the women, I guess, forge a great sword for their consort and in this case she forges you the moonlight great sword making its like umpteenth appearance in a FromSoft game in this one it's called the dark moon great sword radagon would still keep his sword at least in, up until a certain point when a misbegotten crusader got his hands on it and uh he tried to you know put like a golden order skin on it but i guess telltale signs kind of reveal its true origin of being the great sword that Renala forged him before he ran off on her some people also think that she's the lord of the night that's uh, mentioned in all the descriptions of the Nox stuff and having to do with the eternal cities and because she's so obsessed with the stars and the skies it seems possible but we don't really i mean i've, I've delved into that a little bit and uh, i'm working on a whole working theory when it comes to the Nox and their lord of the night and i don't think it's Rani, but i suppose it's possible there's also the interesting fact that we never actually see or hear of her great rune. Instead, we just find a piece of the curse mark of death where it should be and all that. It said she abandoned it, or at least according to Gideon. I don't think she ever states what she did with it, but it's very possible that it's on the moon. That's what a lot of people think. Uh, I don't really know what backs it up, but uh, it's a very fun theory. Also, her ending was heavily mistranslated, so the whole idea of her ending is kind of lost on most Western people unless they, you know, looked it up. I like to make fun of the Rani Simps a lot, but she's a generally pretty cool character and even goes with you on the Einsel River part of her quest where you can talk to her at the Grace Points uh, when you pick up her doll and all that. Which, to me, reminded me of um, the last two dungeons in Wind Waker where you have the uh, the bird girl and then the forest spirit who help you out. It just kind of reminded me of that. She doesn't really gameplay-wise help you out very much, but she provides helpful dialogue. It just kind of reminded me of Legend of Zelda for some reason. She also takes care of her mother, who isn't really doing too well after Radagon ran off on her. She's kind of like lost her mind and just continuously rebirths these scholars in this weird kind of like dreamlike state where she just hangs out. Possibly, you know, just having lost her mind. I mean, it's tough to say, but Rani still protects her and even kind of like puppets her in the boss fight to defeat the player to help, you know, protect her mom, which I thought was pretty cool. She actually gives a shit about her mom. I mean... And with her brothers currently, like, I guess indisposed is a kind way of putting it. She's kind of all her mom's got. So it's pretty cool that she helps her mom out. We don't see a lot of that kind of shit in uh, FromSoft. I mean, in Sekiro, we recently, you know, Robert! You know, that whole thing. That just reminded me of it, though, because the guy was trying to, you know, cure his son and all that. But we're not talking about Sekiro. Some people have claimed that her physical body uh, had red hair, but when I went to go look at it, I really couldn't confirm if her hair was actually red. It just kind of looks like charred remains to me. But I think the least cool thing about Rani would be that she inadvertently turned Godwin into some giant root-bound sea monster-looking fucking thing that's maybe even turning into some kind of a basilisk or developing dragon scales because of the dragon that tried to heal him. It just seems like a really cruel fate just so she could kind of, you know set in motion events where she would become the uh the lord of the stars or bring in the age of the stars it just seemed kind of selfish i mean fuck godwin was like a loved fucking lord and look what how he look what happened to him man it's pretty fucked up but uh moving on that's all i had about Rani. we're gonna talk about uh a favorite demigod of many people the chad general radon what was it something about being beneath me silver on back there's only one rule in this fucking jungle when the lion's hungry, he eats. Often referred to as the uh, Star Scourge and the strongest of the demigods, like he's the fucking Hulk or something. I mean, and he res he certainly resembles the Hulk if he was fucking armored up. But he's the son of Renala and Radagon and Rani's brother and Rikard's brother. 
He, uh, this badass at one point even imprisoned the stars with his gravity magic that he learned from a motherfucking alabaster lord with skin of stone, likely at the school of, uh, Celia, the town of sorcery, which was known for its, uh, assassins and, uh, night sorceries, which were said to be invisible, but, I mean, to us they aren't, but maybe to the enemies they are, because enemies don't know how to dodge them. Anyways... It's really unknown why exactly he imprisoned the stars. I mean, I think it could be to help his mom out because, you know, the whole schism going on with the school and the Carrions. They were like, it was a war between the moon and the stars. But it could be because he was, you know, on the side of the Golden Order and was just imprisoning the stars to halt the fate of the Carrions. You know, it's really, it's kind of tough to say. I mean, what we do know is that he learned gravity magic so he could keep riding his horse after he grew to this massive ass size. But before he grew to a massive ass size, he tried to uh, stomp on the capital at some point. Or maybe it wasn't stomping at the capital. Maybe he just showed up and Margaret didn't know who he was and he just whooped his ass when they were younger. But that seems unlikely. I'm pretty sure he tried to sack the capital and was repelled by Margaret the Fell Omen who stabbed him in the chest and pinned him to the ground at least for a second. We know that he was driven back. Everybody gets all butthurt if I say that Margot whooped his ass. But maybe he did, maybe he didn't. We know Radon was pushed back. The cool thing about Radon is it probably didn't even bother him too much because, you know, he's just a simple man making his way through the uh, the lands between is how he always struck me. I mean, when it comes to motivations, he's like the easiest kind of to figure out, except when it comes to why he imprisoned the stars. But I think it's one of the possible reasons I stated. He's renowned as the hero of Celia for some reason because he saved the city from something, probably from Melania's clean rot knights because, you know, he was warring with her at the time. But then shortly after, they would meet in combat and she he would physically defeat her. In my opinion, Radon won that fight because he's stronger, but Melania has an ace up her sleeve, which is the Scarlet Rot Bloom ability, which basically allows her to become a fucking outer god. At least the Avatar for one for however long in the fight, but... You know, she blasted him with so much scarlet rot that it drove him insane and caused him to become a cannibalistic fucking animal man who wanders fucking this wasteland near Kaled where, like, Jaren has put together a festival, which is one of my favorite sequences in the game. I just love the spectacle of how the Festival of Radon is because, I don't know, it's just one of the few, like, very uh, NPC-heavy events in the game, and it just, it, I don't know, I really liked it. It felt like a welcome addition to something in Souls, like, that I hadn't experienced before. But, so Radon got dealt a pretty fucked hand. I mean, it cost him his sanity, and, you know, he didn't deserve that. For all intents and purposes, and everything I could read about the guy, he seemed like a pretty stand-up dude, and definitely one of the more noble demigods. Especially when you've got people like fucking Godric and fucking Mog in the ranks. But Radon, before he went insane, he inherited his father's red hair, obviously at birth, but fucking, and he was proud of its, you know, heroic connotations. He just loved the idea of being a hero, and he idolized Godfrey, who was uh, America's consort, and, you know, he didn't really have any direct relation to, but he was, as a consummate warrior, he was a big fan of Godfrey's exploits, and he even, like, kind of stylized himself as Godfrey's successor as the uh, Lord of the Battlefield, even adopting a lion motif that, you know, he still rocks to to this day, even in his insanity. And I think as far as uh, bosses who've been driven insane by some type of, you know, indescribable evil or whatever, I think he's a lot cooler than Artorius. But maybe not cooler than Gale because Gale helps us out several times in Dark Souls 3 before we have to fight him as a boss at the end of time. I mean, Gale is honestly, story-wise, one of the coolest bosses I've ever fought because just because of the fact that he you know he helps you in certain boss fights and then oh there it is betrayal you now have to fight him but it's not really betrayal he's just kind of gone insane but you know what I mean very similar to Radon it's funny though that his dad hated red hair and it kind of makes me wonder if he had any you know issues with the fact that Radon was so proud of the red hair I mean or whatever but I don't know, it was definitely the whole daddy issues thing reminded me of Game of Thrones, so I can't help but, you know, mention the whole Tyrion and uh, Tywin situation. But definitely, we don't have any proof of that, it's just a fun observation. But I think that there's really not that many bad things I can say about Radon. I think that he was a really cool, heroic dude, probably the most noble of the demigods. I mean, he definitely had all the best intentions and was just dealt the fuckedest hand for it, so... Nothing really bad to say about the guy. He got dealt a bad hand. And uh, we're going to move on now to the children of Radagon and Merica. 
Now, in a previous video, I made a joke about George R. R. Martin loving incest and how, uh, you know, how I'm surprised there wasn't any in the game. Because I wasn't really that good at enunciating my words, a lot of people took that as me saying there was incest in the game. And no, I don't think that Merica and Radagon, what they did, would be considered incest. I would consider it incredibly fucking vain, but definitely not incest. I mean, it's just a person banging themselves or a, a copy of themselves. It's not... It's not incest per se, but anyway, regardless of that, their kids came out fucked in two different ways, and we're going to talk about them now. So I think the first of the two I'm going to talk about is, um, I'm going to go with Mikello the Unalloyed. This thing on my head is headache medicine. It works real good, except I can't think when it's on. Really think, I mean. Because, you know what, I feel like he's an underrated character. So in my opinion, he's very much the Charles Xavier when it comes to all the demigods, as he seems like surprisingly really wise, despite probably being one of the younger demigods. But he's the son of Merica and Radagon, and brother to Melenia. He's half brother to Radon, Rikard, Rani, Godwin, Morgoth. Mo he's half brother to all of them technically, you know what I mean, because of the weird circumstances of his parentage. His only true sibling, however, is Melania, who kind of sees herself as his protector, which is kind of reminiscent of the twin princes from Dark Souls 3, who one of them was born sickly and weak, and the other one was extremely strong and kind of saw himself as the warrior of the two. Mikkel is interesting because he hated the Outer Gods entirely and desired a world free of all of them. The Greater Will, the Frenzied Flame, the One Great, the Blasphemous Mother, or the Formless Mother, or whatever, all of them. He didn't want nothing. He wanted a world free of all of their fucking meddling possibly due to the fact that he was cursed to forever be a child you know maybe he saw that as maybe the result of some kind of uh other outer god trying to one-up america in a way and he kind of was like man fuck these gods so i'm gonna work towards building a world free of them he started with crafting these gold needles that basically when you inject them in yourself or you implant them in yourself, they ward off the meddling of any kind of foreign or outer god, allowing you to operate freely of it. It could also be because of his sister's uh, curse from an outer god. That might also have contributed to his desire to create a world that's free of them because she was born with the scarlet rot. We'll talk about all that in her section, but he created these needles likely to help her out mainly. He also started growing the Halig tree, which was supposed to be like a, an antithesis of the uh, Erd tree or something like that. Like something that was free of the god's power and sort of served the same purpose, you know, to basically provide a place and, a, you know, for all the outcasts of the world and all that. All the people that have been spurned by the Erd tree and the greater will or maybe even other outer gods. So he had, like, definitely some of the more noble intentions. I mean, I wasn't thinking of him when I kept calling Radon the most noble because Mikella was definitely noble. He just wasn't, he didn't have the means to be heroic. But he was an Empyrean, and Melania described him as the most fearsome Empyrean. But that's just because he could see, like, the true will of people or something like that. Shit like that that reminds me of uh, Charles Xavier in a way. But I think fearsome is the wrong word to describe him because he's definitely not fearsome in any way because, you know, he's done fuck all to be considered fearsome. He just kind of got captured by Mog and it's now, you know, horrible things are probably being done to him and, you know, he's just there in his fucking cocoon. But anyway, we're getting, we're getting ahead of ourselves. He tried his best to cure his half-brother Godwin, you know, of his undead affliction and despite, you know, his best efforts, he couldn't cause the Eclipse to resurrect him. I mean, like I said earlier, Fortisax tried, who was a really powerful dragon, and did fuck all except getting corrupted in the process, so definitely this was something that was out of his hands. He wasn't even probably sure if this was an Outer Gods meddling or not, or just something entirely different, you know. But I do think whatever happened to Godwin is probably the result of, uh, the, uh, Deathbirds, God of Death, or whatever, they have an outer god too, and maybe that's why Mikella took such an interest in curing Godwin because he saw it as more meddling from yet another foreign outer god. So while Melenia was away fighting fucking Radon and Kaled, Mikella went into cocoon form down at the base of the Hallow tree and basically was trying to sleep and grow to a normal size, you know, to be fr since he was now free of the uh, any of the outer gods, he was basically going to finally grow to an adult. But before that could happen, Mog showed up cut him out of the Halig tree and, you know, made off with him and probably a bunch of the Albinarics who were hanging around because, like I said earlier, he's got all these Albinarics in his domain that that had to get there somehow, you know what I mean? 
But he also has a some kind of a fondness for carrying art and like their sword designs because he's like the McKellen Knight Sword is like a mimicked version of the Carrion Knight Sword, but instead of having a glintstone, it has like amber and unalloyed gold. But that could also have to do with the fact that maybe uh, when he recruited Knight Loretta, that she brought some of the whole Carrion traditions over to his knightly order, and they started adopting them. That seems more likely than the other uh, alternative. But definitely the coolest thing about Mikella, I think, is that he's kind of created the Hallowed Tree for the specific purpose of being a home to all the people who were spurned from the Erd Tree, who were, like, scorned by it, who were basically, who their world order had, you know, long ago faded away. He's basically welcomed them all there. Like, you can find any, like, lots and lots of types of enemies there in uh, his domain. And I thought that was really interesting. It's like the, the Island of Misfit Toys, but for all these horrific-ass from software creatures and enemies definitely felt very uh wholesome despite of uh how of how it played out you know and now we're down to the last demigod the rot mama herself melenia the blade of mckella the poster child for elden ring itself the scarlet valkyrie she's got a lot of names I i'm sorry did you just call god a c word yeah He's got a hard on for mass murder and giving kids cancer and this big old answer to the existential plaster fuck that is humanity it's to nail his own bleeding son to a plank. That is a cunt move. Come on, even you got to agree hey, with me. Hey, 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 please. We should love a fucking nuke at him. So, get it over and done with. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> We're sorry, sir. We the goddess of rot, you know. But she's uh, Miyazaki's take on a cyborg. And uh, she's even got fucking cyborg fucking toes. So you know he had a hand in that. Some people see her as a reference to Full Metal Alchemist with her, you know, prosthetic arm and the sword that comes out of it and all that shit. But I think she's something... Uh, original entirely or at least you know a, co a combination of various inspirations anyway though she was born for america and radagon like her brother Michaela, and is uh also basically kind of housing this uh bud of the scarlet rot outer god basically something that was defeated and sealed away by a blind swordsman a long time ago now this same blind swordsman would either uh coincidentally or perhaps you know intentionally become Melenia's mentor and uh, trainer when it came to the ways of the blade and he taught her the uh, water style that she would you know make the waterfowl dance and shit out of it's also possible at some point that she killed her mentor and um, that would explain the second mysterious bloom or the first mysterious bloom that we don't know about but I think that that's unlikely but still definitely a possibility we don't really have much to back that they ever fought other than one description that says when the girl faced her mentor in combat, he saw, you know, wings appear behind her. Now, there's several mentions of her being sighted with wings, so it's almost like she channels a little bit of the rock god in a fight and that people see it, you know what I mean? A lot of people have argued that the bloom in the room next to her boss fight room is hers, but I would, I'm would i pretty sure that's not hers. I mean, I made a whole video about how it could be, and if it was, maybe it was the one that happened when she fought the blind swordsman, but I'm pretty sure now that I think about it that she doesn't necessarily leave a flower behind when she blooms, and that she's actually within the flower, and that the flower seems a little too small, and you find the traveler's clothes, so, so that seems to kind of imply that it's just a previous uh, attempt of Gowrie's, you know, and a previous Swamp Sister that happened to make it further than the other ones. I don't think there's any actual proof that says, you know, that that's Melania's bloom. But I did make a video about how it's possible. So, you know, you might want to check that out if you can deal with a little bit of monotone. Because I did not know how to talk into a mic yet. And honestly, I still don't. So, you know, bear with me here. Anyway, though, Melania's got a good amount of exploits. She whooped Godric's ass, but she didn't kill him. She probably should have, but Mikella probably didn't really need her to kill him. And they, who needed his fucking great runes? So they just left him alive and possibly as an imprisoned lord. You know what I mean? It's possible that, you know, those uh, exile knights are loyal to her, but, you know, I haven't seen much proof for it. But it is an interesting theory. I kind of went over it when it came to the Godric section. But it's definitely a fun theory. I even made a whole video about it. But uh, moving on. Although I will say that her sparing of Godric is a bit irresponsible because look at the monster she left alive. I mean, she basically created a new problem that she doesn't stick around to solve. It reminded me of um, that anime show Shield Hero where this guy slays a dragon, but he doesn't stick around to, you know, clean up the mess. And then the dragon turns into like a lich dragon and plagues the village. It's like a whole thing. It's a pretty good anime. I don't really like, you know, those power fantasy kinds. And I thought that, that uh, Shield Hero is kind of like a deconstruction of that. But I don't know, anime is anime. Everybody has their own preferences. Anyway, moving on. 
I said earlier how I consider her the loser of her fight with Radon, and that's mainly because she had to basically use a power that she herself didn't even want to use, the Scarlet Rod. Maybe it activated on its own. Maybe she had no control over her bloom. You know, what I mean? maybe it knew she was about to get her shit rocked, and it activated as like kind of a reaction. But the end result was clear, you know, she had to be dragged off the field, and Radon was still standing, albeit pretty insane, and he was now standing in fucking a nuclear wasteland. He was basically in fucking a Fallout game at that point. But, you know, he was still standing, and he didn't have to be dragged off the fucking battlefield by one of his henchmen. She also possibly banged Malay Mirai. Uh, of the Shaded Castle and had the five kids with him because, you know, there's this whole weird obsession he had with her and there's the fact that the uh, ghosts of his castle blame her for the castle being in such a state. So I think, you know, the working theory is that he was all depressed over her being dragged off the battlefield that he, you know, went into deep despair over in that field and uh, all the prisoners broke free, you know, with Elmer of the Briar leading the charge and uh, they took over his castle. That's why there's a bunch of goddamn heretics and prisoners of a bunch of different types, you know, that are lingering there. So I think that's possible, you know, but definitely, uh, I, I'm more partial to the theory that Millicent and her sisters were grown from pieces of millennia that had rotted off in Kaled that Gowrie found and cultivated into girls through some, you know, bizarre rituals. We know that the, uh, rot magic is, uh, pretty powerful because, you know, look at what Gowrie is. He's some kind of a pest demon or he's able to just assume direct control of pests at will and puppet them with his visage. It's very, uh, very underexplained the whole extent of the pest magic. Also, uh, Melenia didn't even try to go looking for Michaela. I mean, I guess we don't know for sure if she did, but she would definitely be able to rock Mog shit all over the place if she just knew where he was at or even tried to fucking look. There's, I mean, there's even a portal to his domain in the consecrated snowfield if she just got off her ass. But no, she only wakes up when we show up and then just wants to fucking fight us. It doesn't make any fucking sense. Fuck her. The Scarlet Rot Outer God is probably some scorpion-like thing that existed a long time ago that left behind that dagger we see at the, uh, what is it, the, uh, Lake of Rot, kind of Indiana Jones Temple of Doom area that I can't remember the name of, but you guys know the place. But yeah, she pretty much left her beloved brother at the hands of a fucking pedophile rapist goat man, like, that's not exactly, uh, very responsible. I mean, that's a reoccurring thing when it comes to her, isn't it? Her fucking irresponsibility. She definitely strikes me as one of those people that would commit war crimes and be like, oh, I was just following orders because, you know, she considers herself the blade of Michaela. Everything she does is for him. It's like, well, you know, I think he would like you to fucking go save him or something, you know, not be at the hands of fucking Mog. But anyway, I digress. As I stated earlier, she probably killed her mentor after he tried to pull an Obi-Wan Kenobi on her. Uh, she cut a deal with the Venom Snake of Elden Ring, uh, Commander Nial. That's actually pretty cool. I, will, I won't fault her for that because that character is actually pretty cool. I think her best redeeming quality was that she was genuinely trying to help Mikella in his pursuits of being free from the Erd Tree and all the Outer Gods. Definitely none of the other, you know, demigods were helping him with that. But that's definitely because they're like siblings and they have that weird connection. But the thing I hate about her the most is that she keeps calling herself undefeated. Undefeated. But she uses a fucking god mode hack. How is that fucking fair? You know what I mean? How do you how do you fight someone who's literally the living vessel for a god fairly? Definitely uh, doesn't seem too fair. Anyway, that's all I have on all the uh, demigods. This video ended up being a lot longer than I planned on it being. But hopefully it wasn't too rambly and too just long-winded. I hope I covered at least a couple things you guys didn't know about these demigods. I know the format isn't probably what most people are used to when it comes to Dark Souls stuff, but I really just like this conversational style sometimes when it comes to like a big video like this as opposed to writing like a fuckload of pages for a script. Like I like to make, you know, two different kinds of video, long-winded rants and, you know, tighter scripted ones that also maybe devolve into rants. I'm not, you know, I'm far from perfect. I'm, I'm still learning this shit, but it's uh it's definitely been fun so far and i enjoy making shit like this so i'll probably keep uh occasionally throwing in my long-winded rant videos every once in a while for sure i definitely will have another one coming up soon but anyway i've talked for long enough uh if you guys liked the video please like it if you found it informative that's dope if you uh, have any counter opinions or notice anything i missed there's probably a lot of things i missed please share it in the comments i always enjoy that if you disliked it please dislike you know do your thing uh, if you enjoy my videos, or if you even made it this far through the video, then I would maybe consider subscribing if you haven't already. That would actually help me out a lot. That'd be dope. 
you'd be a real uh a real stand-up guy or girl you know either way i haven't really looked at the whole audience demographics but either way whoever's watching i appreciate you and there will be more coming see you next time have a good one peace makes no bloody sense anyway why some no-name shithead like me should get called to the lands between cruel bloody joke you ask me maybe something went tits over it maybe it's been broke for a good long time the earth tree i'm saying let us speak of the past a while i was once an imperian of the demigods only i Mikola and melania could claim that title each of us was chosen by our own two fingers as a candidate to succeed queen marika to become the new god of the coming age which is when i received blythe in the form of a vassal tailored for an Imperium. But I would not acquiesce to the Two Fingers. I stole the Rune of Death, slew mine own Imperium flesh, casting it away. I would not be controlled by that thing. The Two Fingers and I have been cursing each other ever since, and the Baleful Shadows are their assassins. <laughs>